Section one of Dog Heroes of Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Lives. Chapter one Tig the Goat Herd, a dog of the Sierra Nevadas. The puppy was yellow yellow as a tawny tiger while all his little brothers and sisters were nearly white also he was bigger than they and claimed more than his share of his mother's attention tim borlin proprietor of the pine tree inn laughed as he looked down for the first time on the little family he's king all right that yellow feller and i guess he'll be the one i'll pick for my goat dog blind as a bat but he's got the nerve to shove any of the others out in his way here you tig your mother'll be glad to get rid of you i've got another mother waiting for you she'll bring you up on a different plan borlin plucked the small morsel out of the squirming huddle of blind puppies and carried him off to the goat corral in an enclosed stall lay a mother goat bleeding her sorrow at having been bereft of her own baby there you are susie that's tig now if you take to him and bring him up right he'll be worth one of these days a sight more than your own offspring susie did not approve at all of this substitute for her own kid she looked daggers at it but when the blind baby proceeded to find its dinner as if it were very much at home her brain reeled and she saw things in a mist it was not canny open-mouthed she regarded him as a thing to be dealt with when she could gather her wits together when Tige had finished his repast, Susie began to put the pieces of the picture puzzle together in her brain, and decided that this was a changeling and not to be tolerated. She arose, lowered her head at the yellow intruder, and would have butted him for his impudence had not Tim lifted him out of harm's way. Thus the goat Susie began the rearing of her foster child. At feeding time only was the puppy left to her ministrations, for in these first days she did not like him at all. Tig himself, all unconscious of the change in his source of life, fed peacefully and slept by himself between meals, growing in strength if not in grace. Never did he become a beauty. It was not to be expected with his mongrel ancestry. On the morning of the ninth day of his existence his eyes popped open, and behold, although his mother apparently was a goat, he was not in the least surprised. Susie by this time had become reconciled to the new order of things, and actually began to grow fond of the puppy. They were a strange pair, but now that all was understood between them, Tig slept snuggled up to Susie and became as her very own. When she was let out into the corral, he followed at her side, and she unwinkingly braved the astonishment of the other goats, who had no puppies to feed and love. As a fact, Susie seemed to take a certain pride in the distinction, as one who has been set to rear a princeling. Pine Tree Inn was a roadside affair of very primitive character. Seldom did any one come that way save an occasional prospector or a party of cowboys. It was a shelter simply for the chance wayfarer. Travelers were few on this lonely road, and the Borlands eked out their small living by keeping a herd of goats. For there was coarse grass on the ranges and succulent shoots on the burned grounds, and in time of stress they could climb to heights impossible for cattle. It was no easy matter, however, for Tim Borland to keep them together on the range. Too poor to keep a herder to tend a flock, he depended on a dog for that duty. A dog furnished its own clothes and asked no hire. But the dog who had herded for Tim was drawing to an end of a long and useful life. Hence Tige's training. Curious, it seems, but all the training Tige ever got came from the goats. Tim never lifted his hand except to transfer him from his box to Susie and back again during the early days of her rebellion. When she accepted him, Tim's duties were over. When Susie fared forth once more with the flock, Todd gambled at her heels. As he grew, the superior nature of the dog showed itself. Before he was weaned, instead of following, he began to lead the whole herd. When he was a year old, they called him master. He herded them, and they obeyed. Where he led, they followed. Waking, he guarded them. 
sleeping they sheltered him in their midst at the least stir of uneasiness or hint of danger tige was up and alert ready to ward off the foe there were foes aplenty too on a still night Tige could hear afar off on the edge of the pine woods that bordered the feeding grounds the ho 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 of the coyotes sometimes in the moonlight he would see them running along the ridge or sitting in a melancholy row watching the flock they were too cowardly to attack then Tige would gather his family together and growl defiance to all of wolf kind although any one of them could easily and alone have made an end of him generally speaking tig just laughed at coyotes but a bear now that was something to be considered seriously tig knew that a bear must be avoided at all costs and if he caught the bear scent in the air that day the goats were kept together in a compact mass and at night were led home to their corral worst of all and most treacherous were the mountain lions but of these more later when the feed was good, Tig usually brought his family home at night. That was safer, and then, too, Tig could get his own meal of good meat and vegetables at the inn. But many a night, when feed was scarce on the hills, he would forgo his own eating that Susie and the rest might nibble and be filled. What language they used between them, who shall say? But certain it was that in the dry weather, when the herbage grew scantier and the goats leaner, they managed to tell him of their wants, and he would go hungry himself for their sakes. There came one year a dry and rainless August. The grass grew yellow, then brown, and shriveled down to the very roots. On the burned grounds where the scrub had come up, there was generally something to be found. But now nearly everything that the goats had not already eaten had wilted and turned dry and crackling. When the wind blew, even the pine needles fell off in showers to redden the parched earth beneath. One hot morning, Tige led his hungry flock out of the corral and up the trail, now so dry that the flock soon disappeared from sight in the rolling clouds of dust. On all the feeding ranges of the foothills there was not a blade of grass. They must go farther afield. There was food to be found, but one must go a long distance and climb high. Tige knew of a pasture where the air was thin and cool and where the clouds swooped down, even in the driest weather, to encourage the thirsty green things. Water there was for drinking, too. On one side of the range tall pines marched their hosts down the mountainside, straight to the blue and emerald wonder of one of the magic pools that lie in the bosom of the Sierra Nevada mountains, like jewels on a queen, sapphire at noon, topaz and ruby at sunset, amethystine in the fading dusk. Around and above towered the great snow-caps, whose glaciers were the sources of life. It was a wonderful place for Tige's family, they spread out on the green carpet and nibbled away for dear life. Time here to rest at noonday. One need not nibble and hunt through the whole day and into the night, as they had done on the lower range. Tige hunted out Susie from the herd and lay down at her side in the shade of the bushes. It was a happy world, just blue above with drifting clouds, hazy peaks, and green aplenty all around them. When, late in the afternoon, Tige thought of the long, weary road home, he thought twice. The goats were enjoying life. What matter if their master went hungry for a night? It was no great hardship for a dog reared as Tige had been. So the night went by, the stars came out in the high places, and the moon silvered the pool's rim. Far away the coyotes howled, but hunting was good for them in the forest, no fear for the peace of the herd. Tige kept watch until the dawn slipped over the eastern range, and the goats awoke to the daily business of the provender. Throughout the day Tige's stomach called to him for help, and when the goats were taking their afternoon siesta, and there was no warning of danger in the air, he bounded away over hill and canyon, back to Pine Tree Inn. It was near supper time, and there was a smell of frying things in the air that made his mouth water. At the kitchen door he halted, barked and waited hello tige well wherever were you last night wait a minute now till the meat is done can't serve you first old fellow 
There's company for dinner, but you'll get yours. Tige waited. The sun was disappearing behind the mountains. There would be a twilight long enough for him to get back to the flock. The goats must not be left alone in the dark hours. There were too many dangers. Mary Borlin was serving the meal to the inn guests. Why must Tige wait so long, and he so hungry, and the goats masterless? The goats, yes, he must get back to his duty. Already the chill of the early twilight was falling. Ty gave a disappointed howl and was gone, back to the high range and his family. When Mary Borling came out a few minutes later with a dish of steaming comfort, there was no tag. Across the brown range on the lower hills she could see a yellow dog loping away, but he did not even look back when she shouted to him. Not until another nightfall did he come again. But you may be sure that this time Mrs. Borlin was ready and waiting with a dinner smoking on the stove hearth fit for the king of dogs. He gobbled it. No other word will explain what a dog, after three days fasting, will do to a plate of bones and liver. And then he was off again. The next night he drove the herd home that Tim might know they were safe and well fed. One afternoon, Pine Tree Inn had a visitation which stirred the Borland household to great activity. Where the dusty highway came curling down out of the forest and across the goat range, there crawled into sight a prairie schooner. Two tired horses dragged it along, and a patient cow brought up the rear. As they turned in at the yard, Tim saw in the driving seat two men. Swinging at the rear of the great hood were two pairs of bare feet, the property of a woman holding a crying baby in her arms and a small girl. A boy, just enough bigger than the girl to be called the elder, trudged along with a big Newfoundland dog at the heels of the patient cow. Men came to Pine Tree Inn, but prairie schooners containing women and children seldom drifted so far from the beaten track. Mary Borlin lost no time in giving the broadest of welcomes to the weary women. She hushed the thin little baby to sleep in her own motherly arms, made a cup of afternoon tea for the mother, and then proceeded to the manufacture of such a dinner as made Pine Tree Inn sit up and rub its eyes. There were two out of Mary's precious flock of chickens sacrificed on the altar of the horse block, stuffed and seasoned with sage and summer savory, and roasted to a brown and dripping richness. There were corn and lima beans from the little garden, and last of all, a pie made from a can of cherries that had been hoarded for three years. Mrs. Borland's baking powder biscuits were light as dreams, and there was, besides, goat milk for the children, Susie's best, and coffee for the grown-ups made with an egg and clear as clearest amber. While all this was doing in the house, things were happening in the corral. Tige had brought his family home for the night, and although he saw the big Newfoundland and growled at him, he was far too busy rounding up the goats to pay much attention. Dogs came and went, and were as nothing to him. When he had finished his business for the night, he turned and saw the boy. Tige had never seen a child before, and when the little girl slipped out to find her brother, he was more than astonished. He walked over and sniffed these two beings from another world, and he found that they were humans, and a very nice kind of humans. They patted him and pulled his ears, and before he knew it, he was in the middle of his first game of romps, the happiest and silliest dog in creation. The men threw down some hay for the cow and horses, and Tige's goats, seeing this, decided that Pine Tree Provender was free for all. Susie and one or two of the hardy ones walked over and began nibbling, the others following. Now the Newfoundland dog thought he had something to say about this. That hay had been given to his cow and his horses, wherefore he barked at the goats, and they edged cautiously away, mystified by a dog who could be so unfriendly. In the middle of his grand play with the children, Tige heard the commotion at the other end of the corral. He stopped suddenly, took in the situation at a glance, and immediately stalked the Newfoundland, head lowered, tail straight, and legs stiffened. The big dog paid no attention until Tige was quite upon him. 
then there was a growl a rush and the two dogs met in a bow-on encounter it did not last long the newfoundland was the bigger dog and the stronger he gave tige a shaking up and tossed him aside the horses and the patient cow went on munching and the goats huddled themselves on the opposite side of the corral tige rose from the battlefield shook himself and went in again tooth and nail nobody lifted a hand to help him tim borland was helping mary in the house and did not see the newcomers rather enjoyed seeing their dog whip another and whip tige was for the second time blood was running down his leg but there was blood too upon the newfoundland's nose where tige had caught and held him for an instant the battle was to the strong no doubt of it but for all that plucky tige after breathing a few times tackled his adversary again he was fighting for his principles another struggle a desperate one and for the third time tige was tossed contemptuously aside the newfoundland was king in that corral his corral tige's no use to give battle again crawl away and own yourself beaten yellow mongrel that you are said his bruised body but his heart met the cowardly instinct and whispered guard your flock while your breath lasts within you tige rose to his forelegs and looked at his enemy who bristled beside the munching cow and horses then he looked back at his own family his lifelong friends his susie he studied the situation carefully a goat started once more for the hay tige could not fight and conquer for them but he could use that discretion which is the better part of valor deliberately he headed the goat away from the hay then he turned and with all the dignity of a prince whose fortress has fallen he made a strategic retreat herding his faithful followers away from the victors no more play with little boys and girls no more sharing of his worldly goods with strangers up the road they went and out of sight next morning tim was up at cock crow to look for his missing flock safe and sound he found them on a knoll where tige had herded them all night before he could reach them the dog was up and away the goats following in a few minutes they had all disappeared in the mist that hung over the feeding ground for five years tige had guarded his beloved flock and they loved him from susie to the latest kid they confided their lives to him unquestioningly no coyote ever dared to cross their feeding range the bears knew tige by reputation as reputations go with wild things and in his neighborhood they busied themselves hunting berries he had heard afar off the cry of the mountain lion but they too are cowardly and quail before a courageous eye thus tige kept his flock in safety more by what he would than by what he could have done it was a dry season and either tig had taken the herd or they had taken him to the upper feeding range even up here the air was hot and heavy tig's tongue lolled and it was easier to go hungry than to take that long journey back to pine tree inn moreover he had heard it again that weird cry from the edge of the tall pines and he knew that the great cat was not far off and he must not leave his family unprotected even for an hour closely he heard them all day and at night he watched supperless the next day the same in the afternoon he tried to coax the goats home to the corral but this summer even the upper range was dry and the goats persisted in nibbling even far into the night while tige poor tige although he felt an aching goneness in his tum stayed with them that night the cry was near and hungry as he was and weary he spent the whole night wide-eyed and alert three times he heard it and he strained his eyes into the darkness but saw nothing once there came to him on the night air a scent that made his nostrils quiver and the hair rise along his spine death was stalking in there among the pines at sunrise the immediate danger over Tige dropped into a long sleep of exhaustion, while the flock grazed quietly around him. 
Waking, he lapped water from the blue pool and took heart from its coolness to herd the goats through another long day. It was three days since he had tasted food. As the sun dropped, red and hot, toward the skyline of the hills, he tried once more to coax the herd home to the corral in safety. And now the goats, in their eagerness for feed, not only disobeyed him, but for the first time in their lives they rebelled in open mutiny. Go back to the corral they would not. Even the upper range had been grazed bare. They would show him that they knew more about provender for goats than any dog possibly could. Tige patiently dragged his starving body around in an attempt to turn them, when suddenly they broke and went scampering in all directions. Up on the high ledges were patches of delicious grass. Let Tige stop em if he could. Even Susie obeyed the voice of the wild and raced up the mountain as only a goat can, here where the rocks were steep and dangerous, there by the side of a snow-fed, tumbling stream, now across the open, now into the piney depths where danger trailed upon their hoof-tracks. Disheartened and distracted, Tig set to work to round them up once more. No more hope of a return to Pine Tree that night. One by one he drove them from their paths of peril. Now he dislodged an old whiskered billy from a beetling crag. Now he routed a yearling from a ravine. Now he drove a jenny goat and her half-grown kid from a rich bed of feed by a glacier stream. The sunset light disappeared. The dusk faded into night. And under the stars Tig still worked on, with the faraway cry of the coyotes in his ears. The hours of the night rolled by, and wearily the half-famished leader climbed height after height, sending his unwilling quarries down to join the slowly assembling herd on their old stomping ground. Midnight passed, and a thin old moon came up over a snow peak and helped him with her light. Toward two of the clock at the inn he discovered his own Susie on the far side of the pool. She was heading straight for the pine forest. Out of the depths of it, as he toiled patiently around to intercept her, so near that the old dreaded scent came to him, sounded the fearsome cry of the mountain lion. Oh, willful Susie, bewildered Susie, she ran hither and thither, Tige dragging his tired body after her. Now he was between her and danger. Now he had driven her back to the open, and she was safe and sound on the range once more headed for the confused stragglers that Tig had already gathered together. Now Tig was at the edge of the pool, on a dash around it to continue his task. Again that scent, strong and near. It drew his eyes up to meet on a branch of a towering pine, two other eyes glaring down like coals of fire. The mountain lion at last. The great cat, with arched back and quivering tail, poised, and leaped straight at Tige. But that one glance in time had saved him. Quick as thought, he swerved, just escaping the deadly claws that would have made ribbons of him in another instant. Like lightning, he turned upon his enemy before it could recover and spring again. Now no dog may battle single-handed with a mountain lion and live. Tige knew it. He knew that, with a flash of hesitation or a second's losing of his nerve, the great beast would overpower him. He did not bark defiance. He did not even growl a challenge. There was just one chance, and he must take it, that his own courage might outweigh the brute's ferocity. He sat back on his haunches and waved his paws in the air as if to show that he too had claws. He whined his defiance with a moaning sound that carried a threat and never let his eyes swerve for an instant from the two fiery balls in front of him. The cat crouched as if to spring again, met the unwavering eye of the brave dog, and stopped with a vicious snarl. Face to face with the fine courage of Tige, who was trained to guard his flock, the beast was morally no match for him. And so, through the tense minutes, quarter hours and hours the dog looked down the red menace of those treacherous eyes if he had not seen three days fasting it would have been easier but hard though it was he must do it if he should be killed what miracle could save his family if he could hold the cat there till sunrise it might slink away afraid to do the deed that it might attempt in the darkness 
the narrow moon floated silently and high over the range then the stars grew paler and over the eastern peaks came the first promise of the blessed daylight down on the valley ty could hear faint and far away the crowing of the cocks at pine tree inn chills and shivers of pain ran through his benumbed haunches the agony became almost unendurable rosy streaks of comfort began to flash up the sky down in the pool below the ledge were reflected the images of a dog and crouching cat little moans of pain as well as defiance came from tige's set jaws the end was near either he would hold out till the end of sunrise or succumb to the growing agony of his strained body and fall a victim to the cruel teeth and claws slowly the great cat began to back away with an occasional snarl of disappointment what if the dog should win after all crack a rifle shot sounded crisp and clear across the pool it echoed against the great pine-clad sides of the rocks above all around the breathless hills answered with a note of victory where the mountain lion had crouched there was a whirling coughing clawing mass of fur now the final impulse to destroy it hurled itself toward tig missed and rolled crashing from the ledge into the pool below then a shout tim borland's voice hi tig a sound of running feet tig dropped to all fours stiffly and wearily just in time wasn't i old boy we'll fish that cat out of the pool and save his skin by gum he is a bouncer where did you get the nerve to face him off no mistake about your courage tig looked up in dumb thankfulness and then lay down flat until his strength began to come back then he once more remembered his interrupted task he rose looked across the pool about half the goats were on the range the rest were still to be herded in tim borlin can never be thankful enough that after midnight he had awakened with a feeling of strong uneasiness tige had been out three nights supperless with the moon to guide him he had stolen out without waking mary and had taken his rifle and pail of food for tige and had made his way to the upper feeding range just in time to see across the pool the closing act of a drama which in a few moments might have become a tragedy Tige breakfasted greedily and rested a bit before he and Tim rounded up the last of the straying goats, safe on the feeding ground. Then the man went back to his own belated breakfast. That evening, a limping, footsore yellow dog came down the ranges, leading his unharmed family into the corral, safe for the night. End of section one. Section 2 of Dog Heroes of Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Ives. Chapter 2 Zip, a Dog of the Northland in the white reaches of the great northeast territory of the british possessions stands east main fort a solitary building of logs facing st james bay year in and year out five or six men are exiled here in the service of the hudson's bay company and the life is not a merry one nothing breaks the stillness save the song of the wind under the stout eaves of the fort and the grinding of the ice in the shallow bay when the wind is abroad of an autumn night the dull grumble of the ice pack becomes a mingling of a scream and a roar as the great cakes rip each other's sides crack in pieces and pile themselves upon each other later the arctic reaches down its grim fingers and weaves the bergs into a web of solid ice as immovable as the snow barrens lying alongside for hundreds of miles toward the twilight of the polar zone ice and snow ice and snow nothing else to see till summer breaks through for her brief rain and spreads her mantle of coarse grass hardy flowers and mosses over the barrens and sets the ice cakes to tossing once more in the troubled waters 
beyond the trapping of arctic animals nothing ever happens save the occasional mails and the coming of the yearly supply ship in the long days the little steamer anchors off the mouth of the east main river and then comes the great bustle of the year the lonely men awaken from their surly humors and revel in the greeting with the sailors the business of canoeing or sledging the supplies into camp and best of all in the messages and packages from loved ones in the happy southland then one hears laughter and the men play and joke with each other like rough boys then there are hearty farewells as the little ship steams away to make other men glad and as she dips out of sight the men return for another year to their solitude from time to time other males arrive at the lonely camp and for the canadian members of the little group these have their special joys the arrival of one of these precious bags is a wonderful break in the monotony sometimes these messages from the outer world come through hudson straits sometimes by dog train from lake superior sometimes they come through the great ottawa forests up from montreal and sometimes there are long months of snowy silence when no word of life outside reaches the lonely little fort then the long nights seem never-ending and the winter sun hanging pale above the horizon cheers them but for a little while no wonder then if a month seems like a year no wonder that the men grow surly and morose no wonder that in the face of the sheer blank wall of white sameness one of the number will suddenly go mad we who live in the world of realities cannot conceive of the horror that sometimes settles down upon the soul of a man in the grip of the icy northern silences then he sees visions and dreams dreams and fancies insults it takes courage and grit and endurance to stay for four or five years in the jumping-off places of the round earth and come out whole and sane there is one item that goes to make life possible a most important item too that is the snarling yelping pack of dogs the huskies of the arctic regions they are usually ill-natured surly beasts showing little affection for each other and none for the men trained as they are to obey at the end of a whiplash yet they are courageous brave sturdy chaps with thick woolly coats to protect them from the nipping frosts they can endure and live where men fall and perish from cold and exhaustion indeed the lives of men would be worth little without these four-footed helpers at east main fort in the year eighteen ninety there were four men stationed attached to the camp was a train of eight or ten sledge dogs all but one of them were of the pure northern breed and closely akin to the fierce wolves that haunt the canadian forests and barrens but zip zip was different zip boasted a scotch collie mother and to her blood in his veins he owed his high moral sense and his more tractable nature he did not snarl and fight with the pack he held himself aloof and dignified as became the foregoer in the sledge harness on the trail he preserved discipline among his fellows they knew he was master and obeyed him for he had fought it out at the start with the whole pack one by one mutiny on the trail meant certain punishment from zip and the dogs behaved accordingly so they worked together in a sort of savage harmony bowing to the greater intelligence of the partly civilized zip while the whiplash of the driver who ran on snowshoes at the side of the train fell often on the unruly purebred huskies it seldom troubled zip who was nearest it unless the driver was a stranger and because of his human qualities there grew up a fondness between zip and francois Delard, a descendant of the old french stock of evangeline's acadia the other men at the fort were brainerd carson and boyle britons all brave fearless steady and sturdy but they were not so keen at the trapping nor successful at handling the dogs as francis perhaps it was because zip helped him more willingly for the sake of the occasional caress that he had learned to look for at any rate when an expedition was undertaken which required swiftness and endurance francois was generally chosen to head it so it came about that he and zip were the heroes of this story 
spring had come in and the sun rose earlier and lingered longer with each succeeding day with long strange twilights that almost met and conquered the darkness of midnight eight months of the year had gone by without a sign or greeting from warmer lands when across the lonesome reaches of the still frozen st james bay brainard saw a black point as it drew nearer it resolved itself into a row of black points and later into a sledge team and two men the camp woke up with a bang extra logs were heaped on the fire and by the time the half-frozen men arrived at the stockade things were ready for a great welcome the men shouted to one another and to the newcomers the dogs of the sledge barked a fierce challenge to the huskies of the fort pack the kettle and the coffee pot hissed and bubbled and the fire roared up the chimney with mighty sighs of welcome to those who were bringing life and wholesome thought to the lonely trappers it was hello brainard what's the news none here what you got mail whoop give us the bag hi fellers mail mail hurrah whoop help yourselves to coffee and bacon while we tend to this you carson boyle hands off i'm opening her majesty's budget brainard's trembling fingers unlocked the bag and dry sobs of eagerness came from the other three men as they clutched their precious packets brainard's two children had written boyle's old mother had penned a long letter of yearning love carson's wife begged him to give up the hudson's bay trade and come back to her no matter if they starved and francois delard oh yes there was a letter two three four all in the same cramped handwriting from the little black-eyed girl who was waiting for him in nova scotia and that was not all there were packages of comforts mittens socks knitted by loving hands tobacco tea coffee maple sugar and best of all no bad news for anybody it was a grand mail bag one of the newcomers paused as he poured his second cup of coffee there's another bag hey you son of a gun fetch her in hustle man go easy now no need for you to be anxious tain't for you at all it's for fort stewart and the joke is on you for orders is for you to tote it we got to push on to fort george with another and then the speaker added it's home and peggy for me and no more life in the arctics and we've got two more years of this cold hell afore our time's up well fort stewart's our next-door neighbor they'll be as glad as ourselves to get the bag said brainard how about it jellard you feel like taking a hundred-mile promenade to jolly up the fellows off toward the rising sun moi oui i'll tote em in the joy of his four letters from marie francis would gladly have extended happiness over the four corners of the earth there might be something in that bag for bernard from his jeannette one wander miles nothings i make em in tree o day i take a zip yes and napoleon said carson he's the next best husky also i take a whiskey and brandy they go fellows too forty's enough eh you couldn't have a better day to start cloudy not enough snow falling to hurt anything not so cold that your fingers will freeze to the harness buckles will you do it alone or take boil it is not necessary for sin to that trail he is easy the sledge was packed with francois's camping outfit and food with frozen fish for the dogs and the bag of paper jewels for the men at fort stewart blankets and robes were added and everything was lashed fast to the sledge zip danced barking madly to his station the other three dogs fell into their places in the harness all eager to be off and away then francois appeared clad in furs and woolens snug and trig for the journey with his snowshoes firmly strapped and his long whip in hand marche he cried and with a swing and a jingle the train started over the inland trail that led to fort stewart snowy trackless waste that it was there was no hesitation as to the right direction every dog and man knew the trails from camp to camp as instinctively as the birds of the air francis picked up the landmarks without a pause anywhere for consideration and if he had not known zip had taken the trail many a time and needed no guiding 
lightly francois swung alongside the dogs his heart keeping merry time as it beat beneath four letters from marie two years more and he would go back to nova scotia and there would be a wedding and a little house furnished with his savings not too far from the lumber camps then no more trapping in the bleak barrens of the north but a wife and fireside and babies to toss and hum to sleep with his merry french songs from very joy francois sang now il y avait un bergeret et rom rom petit patapon il y avait un bergeret qui gardait ses moutons rom rom qui gardait ses moutons le bergeret fait fromage et rom 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 petit patapon le bergeret the merry madness of the tune ran with the creak of the sledge runners the jingle of the harness the crack of the whip and the glad beatings of the heart of francis et ron 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 petit patapon up and on over the echoless wastes keeping as much as possible to the northern land slopes for already the sun was making soft patches in the snow on the southern slants where the dogs might flounder and snowshoe and sledge break through following no beaten track and needing none onward they went to fort stewart the snow fell so quietly and gently that it was a pleasure rather than a hindrance the soft gray light of the cloudy day was a blessing to eyes tired of the white monotony the dogs leaped to their task glad of the chance to run after the confinement of the stockade at noon they halted and francois made tea on his eskimo stone lamp only a short rest now for they were fresh and they must make the most of their good travelling weather then on until weariness told them it was time to make camp francois dug a deep hole in the snow and warmed his solitary supper with more tea while the dogs barked and snarled over their ration of frozen fish a light wind was rising but the shelter of the snow walls kept them comfortable as comfort goes when one sleeps in the open of an arctic night through the short darkness and the long pale twilight francois slept at the bottom of his hole with a blanket of dogs above his robes for no sooner had he settled himself than all four of the shaggy fellows heaped themselves on top and he lay warm and cosy until morning breakfast all around and another day of travel through a colder air for the wind was blowing now bitter and biting the snow had ceased falling and as they made camp for the second night the sun broke through the clouds and shone on them for a few minutes they were halfway on their journey and far more weary than on the night before snuggled together again they knew nothing of the march of the heavens above them saw nothing of the stars that tripped out to do homage to the king pole star on his throne of wavering shifting light nothing of the clouds as they slipped away and vanished when francois finally stirred his stiffened limbs and shook off the heap of dogs and blankets he was greeted by a blaze of sunshine not the sunshine that cheers and warms but that frigid variety that mocks one with its brightness the sky was a pale unbroken blue not a fleck of cloud anywhere francois hunted for his smoked glasses for even the eskimo wears his spectacles of horn and he must shelter his eyes from the myriad points of fresh fallen snow crystals that glittered like crusted gold between him and the low-hanging sun toward which he must start on his journey everywhere he looked in vain for the precious glasses he had forgotten to bring them there was a long day before him of dazzling light and already there were pains darting through his eyes francis pulled his cap low on his forehead and started with a great fear welling up in his breast the fear of snow blindness the curse of the lands of many snows once before that spring his eyes had been weakened by exposure and he had seen men struck blind a blindness from which they did not recover for days and weeks i must get out of dis quick hi you zip napoleon whiskey brandy we got to get on ver quick a hurried breakfast then marche and they were away francois did not sing now but he made sure that marie's letters were safe in his breast pocket the round sun glared piteously thanked the kind virgin that there was no wind to make matters worse 
from under his cap he squinted across the snow reaches for the landmarks by which to guide his dogs bravely they went on fifty miles yet to cover the pain in his eyes grew more intense with every moment and he stumbled along without opening them as long as he dared but the direction must be kept for the dogs would follow his lead to whatever point he might turn them one more glimpse he must take his sense of the direction of the sun was dulled by the splitting pain a quick glance out along the trail and then the disaster was upon him a flood of scarlet light seemed to surge through and through his whole being and the nerves of his eyeballs quivered to the shock then a roar like an ocean surf in his ears balls of fire that shot hither and thither then again the floods of scarlet light as if his whole brain had been one great blaze that terrible glare it seemed as if all the light of the sun were eating through his cap and into his tortured eyes with a groan he threw himself on his face in the snow trying to find the darkness that would not come to him ah secure saint vierge marie he cried as the pain grew more and more intense and he dug down into the snow with mittened fingers thankful for the small relief that the cold gave to the fiery horrors he was enduring ah secure marie the crack of his whip no longer sounded but the dogs travelled on unmindful until zip observed that all was not as usual something was wrong quite wrong the sound of francis's snowshoes no longer creaked at his side zip halted the procession and looked around there was a dark spot on the snow back in the tracks they had just made that must be his master there was no voice to guide the dogs forward or back what to do but napoleon and brandy and whiskey knew what to do their morning rations had been too small altogether there was no restraining whip and there lay the sledge and the frozen fish was to be got at by digging and scratching off the straps and coverings the three huskies threw themselves on the sledge and began the attack through the roar of his bursting brain francois heard the snarling and fighting of the pack as they smelled the fish now they were tearing at the inner covering and now they were yelping and snapping as they reached the coveted provender this could not go on if the dogs ate all of the fish they would next get at francois's own food and that would mean death for them all the man struggled to his feet and groped his way in the direction of the sounds with his whip he laid about him until napoleon slunk back to his place behind zip whiskey and brandy following grumbling their disappointment what was to be done what could be done without eyes to see he could not drive the dog straight he could not stay there and do nothing some kind of camp must be made francois stooped and loosened his snowshoes with one of them he started digging in the snow he worked doggedly with closed eyes throwing out the snow with great scoops thanking heaven it was not hard packed and also that the exertion put new warmth in his benumbed arteries there was no stopping to rest in an hour he had dug a hole seven feet deep and five feet across the top banking this on the outside it made a much warmer place to stop and he was at least protected from the bleak and awful cold of the level surface protected too from the rays of the low sun every glimpse of which meant agony to his tortured eyes now he cut the dogs loose and by laying the sledge bottom across the top of the hole he accomplished two things he made the pack slash to it safe from the hungry dogs and he secured for himself deeper shadows into the hole he threw his blankets and robes and stumbled in after them always the floods of burning light seared his eyeballs even with his face plunged deep in a blanket there was no relief marie saint mère he groaned then his hand went to his breast feeling for the four letters from that other earthly marie oh he must live until someone found him he must live his mittened fingers closed tightly around the envelopes and there was comfort in the feel of them in spite of the pain he suffered he fell gradually into a doze and then into a deep sleep something stirring nearby wakened him a dog was licking his hand it was zip he alone of all the dogs at the fort ever caressed or showed love for a master the collie blood in zip was stirring 
something was wrong with francis when one is on a journey one does not lie so long with one's eyes to the ground zip whined a little and shaking off his stupor francis rose felt about him for the stone lamp melted a pint of snow and made some weak tea he ate some pemmican and the other dogs smelling the food began quarrelling and growling while francois unlashed from the sledge a package of frozen fish and fed them with his eyes closed and the hungry brutes snarling about him almost he felt afraid why might they not attack him when the fish should fail but there they were and after all there was comfort even in their companionship and they kept him from freezing it came on to snow the crystals fell on francis's face through the spaces at the sides of the sledge above him shifting the sledge to the windward he huddled himself back under it with the dogs packed tight around him and over him together they shivered through the arctic storm unless his eyesight should come back to him soon he must surely freeze to death to try to travel not seeing where would be the height of madness god knows where they might fall at last to die in the stern clutches of hunger and cold there was nothing to do but wait his feet began to grow numb torpor had spread over his whole body and he had no energy to rub them how another day and night passed he never knew he dreamed strange dreams and saw things that never existed the scarlet flame in his eyes spun itself into strands of wonderful and evanescent colors he was aware of something leaping past him and was it a shower of stars that fell about him or was it only snow maybe one of the dogs had left him but it did not come back and he could not see the dark form as it slipped away silently and was swallowed up in the night no it must have been a dream for now ghostly figures came and went in and out of the hole in the snow moving shapes noiseless and mysterious now he was moving himself travelling fast and faster on his snowshoes down a great slope to the south and at the bottom lay water never stopping in he plunged and when he came up there were green trees and verdant meadows all around he was one of a crowd of little boys again by the side of the bay of fundy now he was canoeing with his paddle dipping swift and silent in the waters of a little stream in nova scotia as he drew near the shore he saw marie little marie with the black eyes and rosy cheeks she stepped into the bow of his canoe and together they sped away through a summer land now it grew colder and snow fell and there was floating ice that crushed against the frail canoe and threatened to upset it marie at the bow grew rigid in the cold and now it was not marie at all but a snow figure and it waded down the canoe until the icy waters crept over the gunwale and down down again he went with a gurgle everything became black and cold and silent a long long silence it was good to be down under the waves where there was no sun no bitter wind no snow perhaps this was death well it was easy going this way slipping into the unknown without an effort down down marie would be sorry but out across the gray twilight of the northern night a silent shape was traveling moving swiftly in a straight line no matter what the impediment toward fort stewart always on on stopping only once or twice to pant or to lick a bleeding paw a dog with a heart of love for the man who was gentle and affectionate to him the man who caressed him and that man lay in a hole in the snow freezing slowly death was not far away dimly in his dog brain zip knew that help must be summoned on and on over the trail they had taken he traveled through the great silences zip the half collie with the human intelligence zip the half husky with the sturdy long enduring body zip whom everybody for three hundred miles around knew as an east main fort dog and a good one zip the wise and tender in that night when francois began to see visions and dream dreams zip knew that things were not as they should be and he stole from the shelter of the snow hole and continued on the trail to fort stewart many times he had traveled it and he knew as well as francois nay better every landmark of the way 
fifty miles he journeyed alone over the snow reaches and at last he barked at the gates of the fort the men tumbling out at the sound found a dog with bits of harness hanging to him and snow and ice in his tangled fur exhausted he was but eager to be off and lead them somewhere it did not take the men long in half an hour a second dog train was ready and zip took the lead back again over his old trail he started bravely but in a little while he stumbled and fell pluckily he rose and started again but not for long he fell and could not rise but lay there whining and ashamed and now the men knew that he was too worn out for further travel and they prepared their minds for a long trip zip was huddled in furs and put on the sledge where he rode in state as a passenger while the other dogs took the fresh trail easy it was to follow over the snow barrens and the men went swiftly alongside on their snowshoes fifty miles straight as the crow flies they followed zip's trail every plunge and stride and leap was plainly to be seen in the fresh white layer of frost jewels how had the dog done it why had he gone to fort stewart instead of turning back to east main fort for help no one knows but he had done this thing and was still alive on the second day he grew suddenly uneasy and being rested with the ride of the day before he took the trail again leading and barking back to be sure that the others followed now in the far distance a dark spot showed against the gleaming white zip gave a joyful bark and outdistancing the train disappeared bodily in the snow something stirred francis as he lay in a numb unconsciousness then suddenly out of the silent depths he shot up to life again somebody pulled him up by the arms a dazzling gleam of sunlight smote his eyes and he cried out with the pain somebody was rubbing him with snow and working his arms and legs he tried to speak but could only mumble something unintelligible then there was more rubbing until the blood began once more to creep through his veins and the agony of it brought him broad awake somebody hurled a dozen rapid questions at him in french that was bernard's voice bernard of fort stewart had he reached there in spite of the snow blindness now he knew that there were two men though he could not see them and at his side was a dog whining and licking his face and stiffened fingers zip good old zip was there you zip were francis's first two sounds that any one could recognize for words and zip gave a great bark and leaped upon him with delighted caresses where am i said francis in french and bernard his friend answered in the same beloved tongue of the acadian habitant we just pulled you out of your cash you had a close call how did you find me zip told us night before last he came to the fort he led us back here the other dogs there were three jumped out of the hole when they heard us francis nodded as he gulped hot coffee they lay on top of me and kept me from freezing zip he brought you and saved my life good old great heart zip there's a hunter at the fort who will give the chief facteur fifty dollars for zip an enormous sum for a husky and the chief facteur said francois will tell him to keep his fifty dollars if he were mine i'd not sell him for a thousand then to himself he murmured as he felt in his breast pocket for four crumpled letters no not even to get sooner the little home for marie and me end of section two recording by myra parker Section 3 of Dog Heroes of Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Ives. Chapter 3. Sarah a dog of the Ettrick hills part one 
cold nipping wind was blowing down through the hills of bodsbeck in the south of scotland straight into the faces of a tired drove of cattle that were plodding over a long descent amid the weird round bare hills that resemble nothing so much as great christmas puddings with stones for plums and here and there a lonely clump of fir trees like sprigs of holly set askew all day the cattle had been travelling with scarce a bare hour for rest and the noonday meal of scanty grass behind them a drover dragged weary feet grumbling at the bitter wind that bit into his bones he was a tall spare angular man with a hard face and a cruel eye not fearing hardship for himself he did not hesitate to inflict it on his cattle and so urged them on with goad and curse if ye were not so slow we'd be at the end of our journey the morrow night ye black imp of satan for what are ye hanging back now i'll give ye something to hang back for his goad came down with a whack on the back of a dog that he led at the end of a bit of rope the dog cringed and drew still farther away shaking his head in a vain attempt to rid himself of the hated confinement a lean hungry-looking dog he was covered with a fleece of long ill-kempt black hair awkward and homely with the lumbering gait of a dog just emerging from puppyhood he had an unquiet brown eye that might have been full of courage and affection had not these been replaced by fear fear of the harsh treatment of his master and fear of the unknown into which he was going if ye were a decent behaving body ye'd be helping me drive the cattle once i get ye home i'll teach ye a thing or two or i'll be knowing the reason the dog cowered behind the drover looking at him out of the tail of his eye with now and then a furtive glance behind him as if he only waited for a chance to slip his noose and be off in a wild dash by the way he had come back to the little lad across the border with whom he had played in his puppy days ye should be out there with bob driving the cattle ye good for nothing instead of pulling back like a coward and breaking the bones of my arm losh i'll get rid of ye if i can find anybody fool enough to pay me more than the two shillings i gave for ye just as the sun dipped behind the hills and its last rays of comfort deserted the weary cattle the drover rounding a black knoll saw in the distance across the moor a gray kirk and a thatched house yonder'll be ettrick kirk and ettrick house and farmer hoag'll be the man to give me a sup of porridge and the cattle'll be having a bit of fodder and a drink at the burn he quickened his pace and the cattle seemed to know that rest lay ahead and plodded a little more willingly bob the drover's dog darted hither and thither keeping his charges in the narrow path doing his duty like a well-trained shepherd but always the black dog hung back sullen and unbeautiful i'd make an end of ye with my stick across your head if we were not so nigh ettrick house i've had more than enough of ye ye ill-favoured beast dang ye where you go to now for the black dog suddenly struck by the scent of something more human than the drover who held the leash or something that came down the wind and whispered to his starved stomach of nourishment had now darted ahead and almost pulling the man to the ground in his eagerness in one direction or another his great desire seemed to be to get away from the hated companionship of the ill-natured man smoke was rising from the chimneys of ettrick house a gray old building it was built of windstones and thatched with straw standing by the side of a noisy burn in the byre cattle were lowing and sheep were bleeding as farmer hoag went among them attending to the evening duties of the farm he looked up as the sound of tramping hoofs drew near and as the drover halted he dropped his pail and stool and came out to meet him good evening to you you are over late on the road it's late enough for us to be nigh famished can i get a sup of your good-smelling porridge for myself and a bit of fodder for the cattle we're travelling from dumfries and we have taken but a small rest since sunrise i have money to pay for the fodder you can pay there'll be porridge enough for ourselves and for you and a snack for the dogs you've a good one there with the cattle the one you're holding looks sullen isn't he all right i don't know what's the trouble with him but he i hangs back and he will not go with me nor do anything i have given a good pound for him on the border 
this was an untruth but farmer hoag did not know that he seemed good-natured enough but he has not taken a liking for me he's a fine breed and i'll sell him to ye for a guinea and two shillings it's worth more than the two shillings to have brought him with me well now come into the house and i'll talk a bit with jamie jamie at his father's call a tall lad came out of the byre he was dressed in brown homespun with his shepherd's plaid thrown over his shoulder but his long curling hair which fell down on his shoulders gave him an unusual appearance although not past the growing age and still lanky he gave promise of being a man of fine proportions his face was round and ruddy and his bright blue eyes were full of gaiety and good humour his glance went immediately to the black dog with a keen look of appraisal jamie said his father since you are soon to be a real shepherd you'll be needing a collie of your own this one's none so bonny but he has the look of a good one if you win his confidence can you spare a guinea and two shillings out of your hoardings jamie thought a minute he would need the dog in a year he would be sixteen and then he would become a real shepherd and a good sheep dog would be indispensable he took a long look at the black dog walked around him and back for a look in his eyes and then said i'll give you a guinea man and it's plenty for such a poor ragged starved looking beastie the drover appeared to consider this for a moment in reality he was hugging himself for his canny bargain well be like i'll have to do it but you're getting the best of a bargain and so passed the black collie into the possession of jamie hoag the drover rested and feasted and next morning passed on with his herd and we are glad to be done with him jamie holding the rope end in one hand seated himself on the stone sill of the byre the black dog still kept the leash taut come hither lad you look like the shira sheriff of selkirk with your brown whiskers down the sides of your face if i call you shira you'll be over proud i'll just have to take you down a bit and call you sarah come hither sarah the dog with tail still between his legs stood hesitating before the unknown the known in the shape of the drover had not been so pleasant as to make his homesick heart leap at the thought of another strange master and yet this one seemed different come hither sarah lad it was a kindly young boyish voice and the ruddy face and the merry eyes were not very fearsome things to look upon slowly the rope slackened the tail lifted and waved its fringy length the timid brown eyes met the laughing blue ones still shrinking a little he came closer with an apologetic wriggle until jamie's hand rested on sarah's head a long look passed between them and in that moment were born in the heart of the lonely friendless collie a love and a confidence that found their echoes in the boy's heart and now that we're friendly come with me in the kitchen and mither will give you a supper to hearten you a bit and a good drink and you can sleep by the hearth till you're rested and then and then sarah lad we'll make a man of you and a braw sheep collie sarah until now had known nothing of sheep herding for his one scant year of life had been spent as the playfellow of a little boy rudely jostled out of his youth on his journey with the cruel drover he turned to jamie hoag with a devotion almost pathetic with great patience the lad taught him the manoeuvres of the shepherd dog and sarah watched with anxiety and eagerness doing his best to understand and trying every way deliberately until he found just what was wanted of him when success crowned his efforts and jamie's approving word or pat told him that he had learned his lesson his delight was boundless his intelligent eyes followed every movement of the older sheep-dog on whose actions he was to model his own he learned the words of command quickly and once having mastered their meaning he never forgot indeed he outstripped the other dog entirely in his eagerness to please this new and altogether delightful master was worth working for and it seemed as if he could not do enough to show his loyalty in a week he could bring in a straying sheep in a month he could round up the flock hither and thither he would dart pushing this one barking here growling there till the sheep obeyed him as one a word from jamie would give him the key to the situation and he would work out the problem for himself he had expedients and seemed to reason things out and if one method failed he would try another always in the end accomplishing his master's desire 
at the end of a year there was no more valuable or intelligent sheep collie in the whole range of the ettrick hills he could gather his clans on the moor steer them down the steep ravines and across the gullies pick out the proper places for fording a torrent and guide them to the greenest pasturage in the springtime no dog was so clever at herding the young lambs that had been taken away from their mothers and at the washing and shearing he worked with the wit and knowledge of the shepherds themselves and jamie oh he never tired of displaying the prowess of his own collie they were two leal and faithful comrades in the long days on the uplands and many were the conversations they held jamie seated on a stone on the hillside where he could watch the sheep at their feeding and sirrah in his moments of leisure sitting in front of jamie with his eye on every move and his ear cocked for the slightest word sometimes the lad on pleasant days would take his violin with him a precious but wheezy instrument for which he had paid five good silver shillings sitting in the soft sunshine he would draw the bow across the strings with a skill marvellous in an untrained untaught youth these were moments of ecstasy for sarah who cared nothing for the value or quality of the instrument standing before the young musician he would lift up his voice in a howl that was meant for a song of heavenly rapture it would echo across the valley like the cry of a lost soul the ears of human beings are not attuned to the shades of joy and sorrow in a dog's voice but there was no doubt of the dog's enjoyment of the performance the shepherds herding their own flocks in the lonely hills hearing that howl and the wailing notes of the violin across the uplands would laugh there's jamie hogue with his singing collie did ye ever jamie's mother too was a source of joy and delight to the musically inclined sirrah on cold stormy days when the sheep were foddered in the fold he would lie at his master's feet in the butt or kitchen of ettrick house listening to margaret hogue as she went about her work singing she was always singing bits of ballads and scraps of lilting song that made one think of the running brooks in spring the whisper of bending grasses in summer the rustle of falling leaves in autumn or the wind in the fir trees in winter she had a sweet unspoiled voice and the queer scottish cadences and minor notes made jamie's heart ache with a sorrow that had no cause something just seemed to stir away down in the inmost depths of his soul it might have been his own poetic genius that was breaking earth a prophetic whispering of the days when he would be known as the ettrick shepherd and a famous poet mither said jamie one snowy morning as they sat thus she had been spinning a little web of melody above the potato she was peeling and sirrah was rapping a soft applause on the floor with his fringy tail mither where do you learn all the sonsy bits of song you sing i have heard you sing more than a hundred well jamie mrs hogue paused with her knife in one hand and a curl of paring falling coquettishly from the nearly denuded potato when i was a bit lassie there was an old minstrel who came to the village and sang to us we do not have them any more more's the pity of it he was ninety years old when i knew him and he taught me the songs ay lad and i know more than you have heard did i ever sing you the song of the lave rock and then would bubble up a little spring of melody that the lark himself would have had trouble to match for quality and sweetness why do you not write them down mither i have not the time jamie with all the work about the house to be tended to and i have to knit more hose for tammas and yourself needing new breeks you must write the words your own self jamie sat silent for a little while then saying come on sir he mounted to his little chamber in the loft found an old copy-book left from the three months schooling he had once had turned to a blank page and sat down to think rubbing his fingers together to stimulate thought and at the same time to keep out the frostiness of the air i cannot think without a pen he said finally rummaging about on his little shelf he unearthed an old bottle of ink and a quill pen the bottle he fastened with a string into a buttonhole in his waistcoat and once more he settled down silence in the little room jamie's eye was roving among the rafters seeing nothing 
Sira cocked his head on one side and tried to guess what his master was having all this pother about i canna think with my coat on said jamie finally and despite the chilly air and the fine flakes of snow that were sifting through the cracks off came the coat after that genius began to smoke then to glow and finally to burst into flame laboriously fashioning the letters like the italics he had seen in printed books he finally covered the page of the copy-book sarah never losing a motion of the hand that moved so slowly in this new and mysterious performance but sarah never did understand although many a time after that he watched jamie making letters on paper that evening jamie came bashfully up to his mother and handed her a sheet of copy paper she took it and scanned the lines carefully then she looked up at her son with a new light in her blue eyes there were more things on that paper than just words there were the color and rustle and odor of the purple heather the glory of the morning and the throbbing meter of one of her own ballads that is not one of my own songs that you have written out my jamie lad you have made a song yourself and it's a good one man but i'm proud of ye you'll be a poeter one of these days that's not all mither listen a bit he had his wheezy violin in his hand putting it to his shoulder he played and sang the ballad to one of her own tunes and sarah sang it too in his own way and to his own ideals of what good music should be margaret laughed at the comical duet but her eyes were full of tears it was her own laddie singing his first song to his mither at the end she clapped her hands you're a minstrel jamie run down to the cowhouse and sing that for the lassies nothing loath jamie went the maids in the cowhouse were just finishing the evening's work and they greeted jamie and his violin as they had greeted him many times before with great enthusiasm he sang his song that is he and sarah sang their song to great applause and jamie the poeter he became from that night his first thrill of reward came when he heard one of the lassies singing his song over her work it was a far cry to real fame but it was the first whisper and what could be so sweet as that first unconscious turning of his creation on another's tongue there came a day when jamie the poeter blossomed into a real independent shepherd when with the knowledge of herding that he had gathered from his service with the neighbors and with his trusty sirrah for his aid he could go into the world and do the work and earn the wages of a man seventeen years he counted to his credit when he took service with walter laidlaw at black house and the mantle of responsibility fell upon him happy days were they that followed laidlaw was a good master and a distant relative of his mother and there was another youth of jamie's own age at black house willie laidlaw together they read books and recited poetry while they herded the sheep through the summer days together they drove them into the fold at night together through the long winter evenings they sat in the ingle nook and dreamed of future glory together they talked of the brownie who haunted the farm at bodsbeck of the fairies that danced in the moonlight nights on the meadow of carterhow of the little maid that was stolen by the fairies and was one day to become famous as kilmany and to help make jamie's lasting fame and always the dog was their companion sharing their duties and doing his best with his eager eyes upon them to understand their talk who shall say at what point his understanding failed him certain it is that he loved the sound of their voices and that he was happy to overflowing in the companionship of his beloved master on the evening of their first arrival at the laidlaws the family according to custom was called to prayers the great bible was taken down and opened solemnly and walter laidlaw read a chapter and made a prayer for divine guidance which was followed by a rousing amen up to this point there was no better behaving dog than sarah he had heard the bible read before now the family rose to sing a psalm at the first note sarah lifted his bowed head and stood with the others then warming to the work in hand he sent forth a howl so mournful that no one could have guessed it was a song of praise but sarah knew and his booming baritone drowned every voice in the room 
this was where he could shine and jamie had always encouraged him in his vocal practice what was his surprise then when he heard jamie in a shocked whisper saying down sarah down lad hold your gab this must be some mistake he could not have heard it sarah howled the louder his tuneful soul all a-throb to the mighty measure of the heavens declare the glory of god and the firmament showeth his handiwork to what better words could a pious dog express his ecstasy than day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge the psalm suddenly stopped dark looks fell upon sirrah from his master and the master of the house the lads and lassies in the back of the room restrained their giggles with difficulty jamie's fingers seized his collar and he was hailed ignominiously from the room to the outer darkness he went hunted forth like a criminal looking backward from the peat stack at the paradise from which he had fallen he heard the psalm begin again and the ruling passion was too strong for him standing there he burst forth once more into song and now jamie came out of paradise and hustled the psalm singer into the byre and closed the door unpardonable cruelty but sirrah never gave up the struggle music was his passion even on the nights when jamie too tired from the day's hard work had gone to bed in the byre loft before prayers sirrah who slept below would lay his nose to the crack of the door and at the first note of the psalm he would declare the glory of god in his own way and to his own meter jamie said walter laidlaw one morning will you go over to mr tweedy's and bring back with you that wild ewe that i have bought of him you'll need sarah to help you for the wild ones are not so easy to manage and where will mr tweedy be mr laidlaw said jamie you'll find his house at stanhope in tweeddale it's a fine journey in the hills but it's long and the track's not so easy you'll have fifteen miles to go i do not know if you'll get the ewe safe home but you can try and sirrah's a canny dog sirrah's the lad as'll turn the trick mr laidlaw we'll be back with the ewe in two days well you can try there's not another dog i trust to it and you're the shepherd as gets it out of him early in the morning they started sirrah leaping at the heels of his beloved jamie and eagerly looking for the sheep that he might be supposed to herd nothing for you to-day sirrah we've but to junk it and find our way to tweeddale but it's a track we've never travelled and a long one the finding of it's one thing and the doing of it's another but it's a bonny morning and we'll frighten up the fairies by the burn side off with ye now do ye not see that old brownie peeping at ye over that stone get him and fetch him to me i have never seen a brownie myself mind ye hold him away darted sarah but the brownie if there was one was too quick for him and he came back shamefaced and dropped behind jamie until the next object of interest took him afield it was indeed a bonny morning st mary's lock lay so peacefully that there was scarce a dimple on the water and the early sun was mirrored there in its round red splendor the dew sparkled jewel-like on grass blade flower and weed it dripped from the bushes with a silvery sound the yarrow flowed merrily down its rocky way and far away where it joined ettrick stream to form the tweed lay the meadow of carterhow veiled with a rainbow mist that seemed made of sprites that one after another unfurled their wings and sped in rosy cloudlets into the blue it was a morning in a thousand now the way became wilder and they plunged through deep ravines and rocky gullies across mad little torrents rushing like truants from school down down the easiest way to the plain now they climbed a round bare hill now they crossed an upland purple with patches of heather here they rested by a noisy burn to eat their midday snack and cool their throats with the clear water now they tramped on through the gowans and heather across a moorland and again they rounded a rocky cliff where a false step would have sent them rolling into a black tarn that lay mysterious and sinister in a pocket of the hills but the rock roses smiled at them and the scarlet pimpernel wooed jamie the poeter with his bright splotches of colour and the whole world was such a poem as no man may ever put to paper 
in the afternoon they came to tweeddale and finally they could see stanhope mr tweedy's home and it was not long before they were resting on the door stone and jamie and mr tweedy were talking of the business in hand i have brought the ewe up from the flock but she's as wild as a roe i misdoubt if you can handle her have you a collie as is canny with the sheep none better in all the hills he'll keep her to the track no fear lad said mr tweedy do you really suppose you'll drive that ewe home all the way with all the sheep in the country betwixt you and the end of your journey i'll just try it mr tweedy then let me tell you you may as well try to travel to yon sun you should have two dogs for the task you do not know sarah mr tweedy mr laidlaw wasn't frightened to have me fetch her well it's at his own risk end of section three Recording by Myra Parker Section 4 of Dog Heroes of Many Lands This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker Dog Heroes of Many Lands by sarah noble ives chapter three sarah dog of the ettrick hills part two so it was settled that they should stay the night for a fair start in the morning the ewe now stowed away snugly in a pen was a wild young animal bred in the mountains and with absolutely nothing of the tractable leadable nature usually ascribed to sheep kind in the morning the instant the pen door was opened she was out and away in leaps and bounds deer-like and fleet it would be a swift and merry chase for any who might follow but sarah was ready from the moment when they approached the sheepfold in the gray of the morning his ears had stood alert and his tail waved in quick nervous jerks of gleeful anticipation as the ewe bounded away up a steep hillock sarah stood still an instant as if considering after her sarah lad one keen look of understanding at his master and the dog was away like a streak of black lightning but not in the wake of the disappearing ewe no cunningly he had watched the direction of her flight and now with the wisdom of a sage he started on a circuitous route by which he could head her off and bring her back to mr tweedy's where jamie stood waiting confident of the ability of sarah to do the work laid out for him up the hill went the ewe picking her way over the rocks as one of the hillside born around by the burnside at the foot of the hill dashed sarah what goes up must come down and that hill was not over high when the ewe happy in her escape from bondage came ambling down the other side there stood sarah waiting and along the burn back to where she had started she had to travel willy-nilly you see said jamie bursting with pride and triumph i see said mr tweedy you'll have her home by nightfall losh but he's a dog in a thousand well good luck to you good dog sirrah hunt her home home sirrah man down the track they went first the ewe then the collie then the boy now and then the harried ewe would make a dash up a slope or down a wild ravine but never once did she trick sirrah with a watchful eye he observed her every turn with supernatural wisdom he thought out her probable cause and intercepted her beating her at her own game of hide-and-seek soon they were both out of sight now and again as jamie rounded the track he would catch a glimpse of flashing white and black and knew that the dog was keeping her in the direction of home here and there they passed flocks of grazing sheep and the ewe would make an effort to join her woolly comrades but always there was sirrah to be reckoned with she would give a bound in a series of desperate leaps and try to lose herself in a huddled flock in at them would go sirrah unerringly he would weed out his one charge separate her from her fellows and send her bleating on her way at the great height over muir water they crossed far in advance of jamie and after that though he looked in vain on all sides for miles of the way no longer did he see a trace of them a slight uneasiness grew up in the heart of the young ettrick shepherd which grew to be a real anxiety as he followed the lonely track without seeing the familiar flashes of white ewe and black dog once down a lonely grill he thought he saw the ewe 
but it was only the snowy foam of a tiny streamlet as it leaped over a great boulder and hurried on to join the bigger stream in the valley the shadows of the hills lengthened and all the ravines lay in sombre gloom only a twinkling bit of water here and there gave back a gleam of the blue above higher and higher climbed the shadows till just the tips of the mountains glinted gold above the purple depths the huddled groups of moss-grown rocks looked like bands of fugitives at prayer the only sounds were the bleating and baaing of the flocks as they wound down the sheep tracks with the blue and brown clad shepherds and the tireless darting dogs but never a sign of sirrah or the wild ewe jamie stopped a shepherd who crossed his path have you seen a wild white ewe and a black collie with brown whiskers none but my own and farmer gilroy's have you lost them if they had passed me on the way they would have disturbed my flock with rushing in and upsetting the quiet again he stopped the master of a homeward bound flock with the same question ay i have seen them the ewe came into my flock fair spent with running and would have hidden herself but no at her heels came the collie and off she goes like the devil was after her likely i'll find them soon good even to you jamie went on but he did not feel overconfident it was none too easy for himself to keep the path that he had never travelled until yesterday a path wild and tortuous crossed by other sheep tracks and almost lost here and there where it passed over rocky ledges that could not be beaten into a track sirrah too had never before made the journey from stanhope with even his sagacity he might easily stray in following and driving back his erratic charge the sun sank behind the farthest range of hills through a gap in the cleuch jamie could see the meadow of carterhow once more lying calm and peaceful in the mellow twilight almost home and no sirrah no yes on a corner of the last hill beside a burn that flowed into yarrow river sat a black dog with brown whiskers patiently he sat until jamie came near his breath came pantingly and his tongue lolled from his mouth but his tail flapped on the stones and there was a gleam of triumph in his eye as he gave jamie a casual glance just a flip of a look and then gazed steadfastly once more at a white spot among the rocks there stood the ewe meekly enough now and glad to rest after her wearisome chase she was cornered neatly and could not have escaped had she the strength left to try as jamie's hand fell on sirrah's sagacious head he looked up again and said with his tender eyes she's yours master then he was up again and driving her on to the byre gay and animated under the approving eye of jamie the beloved as the dark dropped down he herded her not toward the fold but toward the door of black house evidently confident that jamie would want her there but to his astonishment his master took a hand and the ewe was driven to the fold and turned in with the other sheep down went sirrah's tail down went his head it was as if his hard work had been all for nothing just to add one more to the goodly number already there he had spent that weary day for his jamie and at least the bothersome beastie should have been given a pen near the byre loft where jamie slept he walked away in disgusted silence come sirrah and get your well-earned supper sirrah sirrah you old fool you've no call to be grumpy after such a day's good work but sirrah came not down by the peat stack he sat the whole evening and sulked and not one bite would he touch so disappointed was he at jamie's disposal of the white ewe his action said plainly after all my trouble you turned the ewe into the fold like a common animal and i had brought her for you alone master lambing time had come again and it was a very busy season for the shepherds at black house seven hundred lambs did walter laidlaw count in his flock and the time had come for weaning them they were of a short black-faced breed wild and hard to manage and it was no small affair to separate them from their mothers in the fold what with the ewes calling and the pitiful bleating of the lambs there was a din and hubbub you may be sure another lad called jock was set as helper to jamie to herd the lambs on the moor and the two watched night and day there was work enough and to spare cut out for both and plenty more for sirrah and another dog 
for four days and nights the lads took turn and turn about the dogs napping as they could then came a black night moonless and hung with heavy clouds that seemed almost to rest on the earth one could not see his hand before his face even on the open moor the incessant bleating and crying of the hungry lonesome little creatures filled the air with a great clamor now and then a few would detach themselves and run about aimlessly bleating louder than ever but they were encamped too far away from the fold to hear their mother's pleadings so it came to nothing sirrah or tyke the other dog always discovered their attempts to return home and drove back the rebels the night wore on and finally the wailing and grumbling ceased tyke wearied with the never-ceasing activity of the day dropped exhausted by the side of jock who was sleeping heavily only jamie whose watch it was moved to and fro to keep the chill from his bones while sirrah sat sharing the watch with eyes on the flock and with now and then a glance in the direction of the moving shape he so loved near midnight a silence fell heavy as the hand of death the little night noises of the spring seemed suddenly hushed the oppression of the still darkness and the long watch settled over jamie and even as he passed to and fro he slept as soldiers will sleep on a long and dog-weary night march in the midst of the flock began a stir a ghostly murmur at first then a low rumble but it failed to rouse the sleepwalker or the lad on the ground only sirrah rose with a low growl waving his tail with a short nervous motion his head forward and his ears cocked the noise grew slowly louder and louder a sound of many bodies moving sirrah ran and put his muzzle in jamie's hand master he seemed to say there is danger awake and be ready eh hey, what said jamie lifting his head with a start the sound was a roar now like a waterfall no not that it was the sound of an army tramping the dead air woke to life and whirled around the whole flock was moving jock jock wake up man the lambs are swirling ay they were indeed round and round in an aimless but concerted spiral the lambs were moving in an uneasiness without a leader a spontaneous mother yearning seemed to move them then as the momentum increased they seemed to fly off from their circle in three tangents and with a roar of rushing bodies and a clamor of crying for their mammies they separated and the lads with their eyes accustomed to the darkness could see enough to know that the flock had broken into three great masses one rushing southward another to the north and the third and largest mass heading straight toward the fold if they found their dams there might be a general outbreak and many lives lost sirrah sirrah man they're running away hold them back to the moor jock and jamie were madly waving their plaids and shouting following the division headed for home that must be stopped at all hazards they whistled to the dogs and tyke came up excitedly but sirrah was nowhere to be seen suddenly the retreating thunder came nearer again the lambs headed for the fold had turned their course and were coming back they swirled and swished once or twice about the astonished shepherds and were off again into the darkness of the moor i'm thinking they will not be back here said jamie do you jock follow the flock as is running south and i'll take the north tyke can go with you so they separated and were swallowed up in the black silence to make sure of the worst danger being passed jamie went to the fold but nowhere was to be heard the bleat of a lamb then he struck out to the north following a well-known sheep path by which the lambs might have travelled for an hour he walked wrapping himself tighter in his plaid to keep out the chill of a rising wind now listening now running ahead at some fancied sound stumbling over rock and bush across the moorland now on the hills with the shepherd's instinct for the track up hope and down cluch across yarrow river at a ford then listening again no sound at all now save the running of water and the moan of the rising wind in a clump of fir trees he must have followed the wrong path 
back again exhausted and shivering to a place where another track branched off and led up far away into the black cleuch a deep and dangerous ravine still no sound nor any trace of the lambs or the missing sira a pale light grew and spread over the cloudy east the wind which had nipped jamie began to clear away the gray banks and the light grew to a ghostly yellow it was easier now to travel although to men who are accustomed to the open at night things become simple that to the stranger would be impossible jamie had wandered far and the first real crack of dawn showed him the black cleuch wild and desolate stretching its perilous rifts below him as he followed the sheep path worn like a gully into its steep side across the cleuch he saw a gray figure also looking with searching weary eyes and beside him a dejected sheep-dog jock and tyke they were and as jamie came up to them a more forlorn pinched and haggard-looking trio one would not care to see have ye seen anything of the lambs not since the dawn once in the blackest of it a crowd of the beasties came past me but they were daft like and tyke and me could not stop them they just went whirling away and we lost them tyke is fair worn out and could not run after them have you seen aught of sarah i do not know for sure there was a beastie running alone behind but i could not tell if it might be sarah or a lamb well we must give it up and go home mr laidlaw will want to pull us by the ears for losing the lambs maybe we will get some of them yet but it's more likely they're all in the hills and the smallest of them may be dead heads down with disappointment they started for home the two lads and the dog cold and hungry dragging legs of wood out of black cleuch they clambered over hills and down into another wild gorge known as flesh cleuch suddenly tyke lifted his head and sniffed the air excitedly then he barked and started forward as fast as his tired feet could carry him round a bend he went the lads following and jock cried there's a body of lambs in the cleuch look jamie jamie looked and then started forward roused to activity it'll be sarah the canny old devil he is he's found one of the divisions and he's holding them who knows but he'll find the others yes there stood sarah ready to drop with fatigue and anxiety but attending strictly to the duty that was plainly his to hold the lambs until his master came he gave a joyous bark when he saw jamie but he never stirred from the spot where he had mounted guard the sun broke through the clouds and trembled a moment down the cliff to laugh at sarah's night work the lads looked down and began to count the flock one hundred two three four five preserve us all said jamie at last with a great happy roar of laughter it's not canny sarah's got them all the whole seven hundred i dare say there's not one of them missing what do you know about that now sarah you rogue how did you know the way of finding them it's past belief there's not another dog in the county as could have done it said jock sure enough there was the whole flock not even the weest lamb missing it seemed incredible but it was nevertheless true how had sarah accomplished the wonder no one will ever know how in the blackness of the night he had driven one division until he found another and back again until he found the third but there they were a weary but sore flock and his own head sagging from pure heaviness but all safe sarah grew old alas that the life of a dog is so short when he would seem to be at his best there comes the clouding vision the weakened scent and the faithful friend is a poor old body there came a time when sarah could no longer do the active alert work of a young dog and a shepherd dog must be equal to heavy tasks or he is not of use jamie now had also a son of sarah hector by name young and well trained as his father had been and he felt that he could not impose on the laid laws by keeping a useless old dog the fight for existence on the bare hills of scotland sometimes puts the recognition of past service in the background and charity must bow to necessity sarah lad said jamie when he could no longer put off the evil day 
you cannot do your work well with your old eyes and your poor hearing i must let you go but you'll get a good master and you know him it's sandy mcwhirter and the work with him will not be hard i cannot bear to let you go old man but go you must no sandy you need not give me the pound now bide a bit and see how sarah holds himself sarah you are to go with sandy and work for him do you know what i say lad go away with him now and you're not to come here any more the light went out of sarah's eye could this be jamie speaking to him he was to go with sandy well so be it he looked at his old-time master with a heartbroken whimper and then with his head hanging followed after the new after all perhaps it was just a loan to help sandy with his small flock for a day so taking heart again he went all the way with sandy and slept quietly through the night morning came and he went with sandy and his flock to the moor all day long he worked nobly driving the sheep in the way they should go doing his duty like the best collie in the ettrick hills to-morrow he would be going home again to jamie and then he would receive his reward of praise night came after a weary day but no jamie came to fetch him cyril watched until the darkness closed him in and refused his supper sandy fearing that he might run away shut him in an empty sheep pen for the night but he need not have feared sarah had been told to stay with sandy and he would not go until jamie came to fetch him and risk the mortification of being sent back all night he lay waiting morning came and still no jamie and now sarah began to realize that jamie had deserted him there would be no more evenings in the cowhouse when he could sing to the tune of jamie's fiddle no more happy days on the hills and moors tending and herding the sheep while jamie and willie laidlaw read poetry and talked of the fairies often before this jamie had lent him for a day to one of the family but at night there was always a welcome back now that was to be no more sandy was kind yes but he was not jamie sarah's allegiance had been given forever to one master through the night he lay awake with his head between his paws in deep dejection in the morning hunger drove him to his food and afterwards he went with sandy to the fold but instead of driving the sheep as usual he hung back and followed sandy at a little distance he had made up his mind as to how he would meet his fallen fortunes at them sir commanded sandy don't you see that old you running away at her man into the flock dashed sarah but he paid no attention to the straying ewe among the sheep he ran like an unbroken puppy barking in the midst of them and creating all manner of confusion in the erstwhile orderly flock what's got you sarah you're not yourself run for the ewe you, you ill-favored sinner sarah cocked his eye at sandy tossed his head and with a loud bark of defiance made another wild dash at the sheep who lost their heads and had it not been for sandy's other dog they would have broken out across the moor in all directions sandy tried moral suasion he tried beating he tried bribing he tried every known method in vain sarah would not work the master he loved above anything on earth had deserted him and no one else should get a day's work out of him and no one ever did sir's pride kept him from going back to jamie somehow his lonely heart understood that sandy owned him now but work for sandy he would not no indeed if he was too old to work for the one that he loved he was old enough to retire from active service and retire he did sandy took him to his father who kept him till he died for the sake of what he had been in his young days never again did sarah attempt to go either to black house or to the old home at ettrick but he knew the old road that jamie took to the hill with his flock he might perhaps go there for a glimpse of the master he so loved in the early light of an autumn morning as jamie's flock went afield cropping the grass blades along the accustomed track jamie saw waiting for him an old black and tan collie with brown whiskers sirrah sirrah lad sirrah came bounding almost up to jamie then suddenly remembering he dropped his head and stopped still with a piteous look that made jamie choke back a tightening of his throat 
Sarah lad, you are not my ain collie now, but you can come and speak to me in the morn. Old Sarah, come. Sarah came, but the old trustfulness was gone. He laid his muzzle in Jamie's hand for one instant, and then turned and walked sadly away, following with his eyes the flock he had herded so faithfully and long. But he made no attempt to follow. Jamie went on to the hills with a sick heart. Now and then he looked back at Sarah, watching, watching. But the past could not return, and the dog sat there, deserted and forlorn. Many times after that, Jamie saw Sarah waiting for him at the base of the hill, but never again did he come near, and never again did Sarah do a day's work for any man. He did not live long. What was there to live for when his life work was forbidden him, when his faith was uprooted, when his heart was broken? End of section four. Recording by Myra Parker.